Welcome to PatsCast, the unofficial Regina Pats podcast. This is episode 142, April 29th, 2023. All right, this is our year-end wrap-up show. we got Chris here, we got Kevin, Ryan McNally, and Drew Posty joining us. Thanks to you guys for coming on. I think we're going to have a good show today. Yeah. Um, first shout-out, I just want to say shout-out to Greg and the gang at Wheaton Kia for having us again this year. Appreciate the use of the boardroom. And uh, yeah, so welcome, guys. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for having us. Thanks for thinking of me. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Ryan, thanks for uh, throwing out his name. We were Kevin and I were racking our brains. Who, who's another guy we should bring on? And then, boom, perfect guy, right? I don't know how we forgot about Drew, but we threw around some names and we're like, oh, I don't know. But, There's yeah. so many good guys around this city yeah. that have and so just, much knowledge about the team. So <laughs> Right, and then yeah. just trying to find somebody that is available that's and works. So no, that's great. It's, yeah, it's, uh, I was looking forward to it. Yeah, so um, I don't know where we want to begin. Uh, maybe maybe uh, going into the season, kind of everybody's expectations of this team, like what you thought was going to happen. You know, I honestly had high expectations, and I know there were some good teams in the Eastern Conference this year, but I thought they could compete for one of those top three positions, and obviously we know that didn't happen for various reasons. But uh, I think part of that was obviously because you look at the group that they had, and, uh, you know, right away you see Connor Bedard, uh, Alexander Suzelov, turned out to be something really, really special. Stanislaus Svozel, obviously. And then someone like Borja Vallis, who came into the season and said he wanted to maybe score 30 goals this year. And we knew Drew Sim was going to have put in a lot of work in the offseason. And we knew he was going to come in probably a lot better than he was the year before. So my expectations were honestly probably a little bit too high because there are some really good teams in the Eastern Conference this year. And, uh, you know, I, I think at the end of the year, it was kind of probably more realistic where they ended up. Yeah, I think uh, Saskatoon kind of caught everybody by surprise. Uh, I don't think anybody expected them to be second in the East by any means. Um, that said, you know, I still think this is a good year by the Pats. Um, you know, they made the playoffs for the first time since 2018, the Memorial Cup year. And, uh, you know, they showed a lot of strides for everyone not named Bedard, you know, showed a lot of what they can do, right? Like, I look at their 16 year old group and think, you know, hey, like these are WHL players, right? They're not just guys that, you know, got scrapped together to throw together a team. You know, I, I think that, uh, well, next year's going to hurt a little bit. I think they're still going to be in a pretty good spot moving forward. I, I kind of echo everybody's comments so far. Um, I, I expected the Pats to be like a 40-45 win season yeah. just because of Bedard. Mm-hmm. Just because of Bedard. And uh, it didn't happen. Due to various reasons, the prices were too high to pick up extra forwards or extra players. I don't know what the deal was. They couldn't keep the puck out of the net, even though Sim improved a lot. They had trouble with the defensive zone, but yeah, made the playoffs. Like Ryan said, it was nice to see the playoffs. Took Saskatoon to seven. It was great. Yeah, for sure. Um, I think when we did our wrap-up show last season, everybody was pretty high on this group. And uh, I, I think I had the lowest win total at like 38 or 39, and, and they – almost made that so i was over 40 i know i think it was like 45 (laughs) and rob was about 50 he was like they're gonna they're gonna go all in and which i was too and obviously they didn't um i think maybe they didn't want to just mortgage the future again right um and like uh you said that uh the prices were so high at trade deadline and stuff like that and it Even was, before was, the deadline, the prices were pretty true. high to get to get Samaremba. That was yeah. a, that was yeah. a yeah. pretty high price, right? Um, and like you said, the guy said uh, goaltending. That was a, a a key point that needed to be improved this year. And uh, they brought in Cole McInnes. They made that deal. And sure, he didn't work out. But I think just the fact that they made a trade for another goalie for the competition made Drew and even Keeper. They they brought their game up and they both talked about it the off season that they worked on their mental side of the game and all that. And they both came in and looking better, but the team as a whole still had problems keeping the puck out of the net. You look at the stats, uh, was it goals against, they gave up the same amount of goals, exact same amount of goals as last year to this year. It just didn't seem as bad. Did it like, 
No, it didn't. And I think there was so much focus on offense. And it's just human nature when you have a player like Connor Bedard that there's just going to be so much focus on offense. And maybe the defense kind of wanes a little bit. And not from the coaching staff, because that's obviously a very knowledgeable coaching staff that they have. But just those young guys, they're just, they probably know, hey, we're probably going to score four goals more nights than not. And, uh, you know, it's kind of like the problems the Edmonton Oilers had at the NHL level a little bit with Connor McDavid and Leon Dreisaitl. They can't keep the puck out of their net for some reason. And I honestly think, you know, it just it's so simple that it boils down to maybe just a little bit of subconscious human nature. You, you know you're going to get four, sometimes five goals a night, and uh, all of a sudden you find four or five in your own net. And it's funny how things work that way, but, uh, you know, it's, it's so tough to pinpoint what it was, and that's really all I can come up with, to be honest with you. It sure seemed like games that the Pats would have normally lost 5-3, they were winning 7-5. Yeah, yeah, that's a good this point. Exactly, game, yeah. Right? Yeah. Like, you know, and maybe it's the increase of Connor Bedard's points, but also, like, Suze Delev helps with that, right? Um, Svozel played really well in the back end. You saw his game skyrocket, I would say, uh, this season from the back end, you know. And guys kind of chipped in where they could, right? And, you know, remember, like, that game against Winnipeg that's right now still playing hockey, you know, Regina was down three nothing, and they came back and won that game four three. Yeah. Definitely on the back of Connor Bedard, but you know, there's games last year where it would have just rolled over. Definitely, yeah. I mean, like they scored uh, twenty two more goals this year, so yeah. that's. I, I don't know about you guys, but I find it hard to really pinpoint the identity of this team this year because they beat the best teams in the league. They beat Winnipeg. They they beat Saskatoon. Um, you know, they beat those good teams in their regular season, but then one night they lose to the Edmonton Oil Kings, and uh, that happens to every team, but it just seemed like it was really hard to pinpoint the identity of this team this year. And I think it was Ken Schneider that midway through the season said, we're right on the bubble of being one of those top teams, and then we do it, and then we fall back into one of those middle-of-the-pack teams. And uh, I thought that was an excellent point that he made, and it was really, really hard to kind of pinpoint the identity of this group throughout the year for whatever reason. It seemed like they had the talent, and they were right there, and they would kind of get there, and then they would drop off for whatever reason. Yeah, it seemed like they couldn't get on a roll. Yeah, like, yeah, except when they went to BC, like they they, they had that good road trip, and then boom, you lose Bedard and Svozel. That was probably, I wouldn't say a turning point, but that could have, if that the juniors weren't there or they didn't happen or whatever. I mean, it happens every year, but if they could have just rolled with that, like I think the team could have really taken off. I mean, they come back and they they really struggled, obviously, with both those guys gone. Um, yeah, so trades, I mean, like, they make that McKinnis trade. They make the Aremba trade that, that was pretty steep. Um, they bring in a veteran guy, uh, Tanner Brown. Um, they need some help on the back end. I mean, that's going to be a huge issue next year. Uh, then the Dubinsky trade, that was kind of that's kind of odd because he's an offensive guy. It's kind of guy you want. Now, I don't know if there was other issues um, or not, why they moved him, but uh, they bring in a young guy, uh, Chance. He, he looks promising. See what happens there. And then... So as a 20, then they end up with Janelle. And, I mean, he brought a different game to the team. But, uh, I mean, as a 20, he would have liked a little something more. Like, you look at the Chase Weefcrop trade, fourth rounder for Lethbridge, uh, for PG, and uh, he goes and scores 100 points. Like, you know, just, I mean, nobody's seen that coming, right? But, you know, something like around there would have been would have been real nice mm-hmm. out of a 20. I think Dubinsky had some injury issues in PG, but... Uh, uh, he had a decent season. That would have been good for the But Pats. to have 220s on defense and still allow 277 goals, that's harsh. Yep. It is. Yeah, but imagine if we didn't have those guys either. Like, Brown was kind of hit and miss. Like, he, he he shows his flashes of his experience, but then he, he had some issues. And Bateman, he was just his shutdown kind of guy, right? And, and yeah, I don't, I don't know. It's, Could they uh, have kept McNutt over one of those guys and maybe brought another 20-year-old forward? Yeah. Because um, they gave up McNutt for a fifth. Well, they got a decent value return, but to, to when they acquired McNutt, it was it was a pretty steep, pretty yeah, steep price. Yeah, you, you look at Sloan Stanek. Stanek. Like, <laughs> that, that, they were in need of D-men last season there to make, to, to, to make that trade. They were, they were in a tough spot, I think. But then they didn't kind of need him near the... After that, he was, he was a scratch, and you gave up Sloan Stanek, and uh, that was a, a tough... There was games season. where McNutt was playing forward too. That, exactly, yeah, yeah. right. Like about that. Was, you know, it was kind of crazy to yeah. 
sit there and like, oh, he just wants to get in the lineup every single night. Right? Yeah, and, definitely. Yeah. Um, and then you look at uh, they bring in Harmacy, another D man. I don't, I don't know what his status is for next year. He, he for Easton Armstrong. For Easton Armstrong. Armstrong yeah. was a pretty. He was a. I wouldn't say a fan favorite, but he seemed to be well liked amongst the people and the players. Yeah, seemed to like him. He had you know a really really underrated shot. He was a big guy, lots of size, and uh, you know. Another 20-goal guy that they could have had, kind of like he's a different player than Sloan Stanek, but probably puts up similar numbers to what Sloan Stanek puts up in Prince Albert this year, too, if he stays with the Pats. Yeah. They yeah. Gave, also gave Easton Armstrong a chance to win, too, right? And, you know, I, I think kind of the Pats knew they weren't going to get past Winnipeg. And also, Ullman Harmacy, like, before the injury, you know, he looked like a really solid young defenseman, too, right? Someone that this team could roll with now granted as you mentioned chris like not sure what's his picture is for next year he seems to have disappeared yeah <laughs> yeah right mm-hmm. got hurt and disappeared so i mean i guess we'll see right i mean if he's at camp and wanting to play then by all means or yeah. can play i guess with yeah. the injury right so yeah he, he did show a little bit of offensive upside he, he's got some good skating ability and stuff like that move the puck well um yeah, then they move out keeper at the trade dead near the trade deadline. Um, I mean, that's not surprising. I think they want Pine in here. Yeah. And I mean, you look at next year, uh, Sims a twenty, Pine's eighteen. I mean, see how it goes. I mean, they if if Sim has another just solid season, maybe somebody picks him up at the trade deadline, and it's Pine's team, right? I think they'll probably roll a Sim as a as a starter, and then Pine will maybe get twenty five percent of the starts, kind of thing. I don't know how they're gonna how they're going to run it. But I mean, who knows what this coaching staff is going to look like next year too. Right. So, um, and then and query, would they, they roll with pine and, uh, the, the new kid, the 15 year old, 16 year old next year, mm-hmm. chase cruise, cruise chase. Yeah. That's, that's another, <laughs> yeah. yeah. They, they could. Yeah. <laughs> if they go, if they go into full rebuild mode, that's, I think that's just like a highly likely scenario. And one thing about Kelton pine was he played against a lot of good teams. He played, I remember one game against Seattle this year, they got beat six, nothing. And we were trying to figure out some talking points with the coaching staff after the game. And, we had to boil it down to, did you know, did you throw him in there just for the learning experience? And they said, yeah. So Kelton Pine's probably going to come in with a lot more confidence next year because he played against some of the top teams in the Western Hockey League this year when he did get the starts. So I, I, I'm a big fan of Kelton Pine. He's a local guy. And uh, I think, you know, the, he's, he's the future goaltender of this team right now for sure after Drew Sim uh, departs. He even showed flashes the season previous too, right? Where, you know, he, he did, came yeah. in and, you know, like his first five – starts i think he got like two shutouts right mm-hmm. like he was playing really good in goal and helping the team kind of go on a mini run i guess because they were trying to fight for one of those last playoff spots and obviously didn't get there but you know like he still played pretty well even this season right like had to start in melville didn't have a lot of you know help in front of him in the sjhl with the melville millionaires but you know still put up decent numbers win losses weren't all there but again I think that's more indicative on the five in front of him, right? Um, and then, yeah, it comes up to the dub, and I thought played really well this year. Yeah, like it's, you said. It's pretty hard to get into the groove when you only play once every 10 days yeah, or every 14 so days or whenever there's a back-to-back or whatever. It's pretty hard to get into a groove. Tough. Yeah, and then he did kind of get thrown to the wolves a bit, gave Drew those those hard games off, which I don't want to say they punted on those games, but they kind of punted on those yeah. games, yeah. right? Okay, we're we got we got to go for this win against this team, Kelton. You got to you got to kind of eat it on, and like you said, the Winnipeg's and. But I mean, he went to Red Deer. I think they lost in overtime in that one road trip. Yeah, um, yeah that's right. So he played well. Um, so yeah, another another, you know, I guess a full season with the Pats next year, and I think he he is the future. Obviously, it'd be pretty hard to see him only get twenty five percent of the games as an eighteen though. So what do they do? Yeah, Sim probably wants to start. Well, he is the starter. But he, he wants to start. He'll probably yeah. want to get 45, He, he isn't looking to be 50-50. Yeah, exactly. I so. think they might go like a 60-40 split up until maybe the deadline. Then Sam gets shipped off somewhere. If, if there's some interest, yeah. 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 Well, yeah, it, it's interesting. And like you said, the, the coaching staff, who knows? Because obviously John isn't going to be coaching this team. Whether or not he's GM, that's that's another story. But like he only came back because they fired Stroosh and – He's like, okay, I'll take over and, and run out the course with Bedard, and and then I'm pretty sure he's going to move on to 
either GM or maybe right out of the organization. You never know. I'd like to think that uh, John Paddock sticks around. Um, you know, maybe not as, as you mentioned, Chris, maybe not as a coach, but, you know, as that, in that GM role because he's proved that, like, he can do some pretty cool things, you know, in the general manager's chair, right? I mean, the, f- the foresight to see the Connor Bedard, you know, draft and make sure that that pick from Lethbridge is the swift current first-round pick, right? And unprotected for Jake LeSish and Nick Henry, right? And, uh, you know, the lottery balls fall his way and he gets Bedard. Um, you know, like I, I'd like to think that uh, John sticks around as the general manager. I think, you know, the fans still like him, right, as the GM. And for head coach, you know, Brad Haroff's a young guy. The players seem to respond well to him. You know, I'd, I'd like to think it's Brad Haroff time here in Regina, but I could be wrong. <laughs> I guess the one thing about John is he's been around for so long and he knows so many people. <laughs> the Regina Pats probably don't have an issue finding a head coach if they decide not to hire internally. So th- that's one area that I'm confident in is if, you know, like you said, Chris, if John doesn't want to, you know, step behind the bench next year. There's hundreds and hundreds of connections that he has, so I, I don't think they have a problem finding someone that wants to come in and coach this team if it's not a, an internal hire. So uh, I'm excited to see wh- who it's going to be. And maybe it is still John, but uh, if it's not, I think there's a, a plethora of people that would be lining up to come coach this team just because John Paddock still has his hands on the group. Yeah, but if they do go into a full rebuild, are veteran coaches going to want to come here? No, that's a good question. Well, young yeah. guys that are just trying to break in want to come here? And- I, I think it would be more, yeah, probably like you said, young guys that are, you know, junior A guys that are getting their first opportunity or university guys that are getting their first opportunity probably. But uh, who's to say? <laughs> but do you get those guys that come in and then they have a really bad first year and yeah. then it looks bad on their record for the rest of their career? So would they, if if there was a change, would they try to bring in a vet, like an old school coach, like a, throwing out Habshide or somebody like that. Yeah, and that's kind of what I mean, just because it's John Paddock that's here, someone that's been around forever, and maybe he's one of the few guys that has the ability to bring in a veteran guy and say, hey, we're going to have a tough couple of years here, we're going to have some rebuilding years here, but uh, I think he'd be really good for the group, and uh, maybe because it's John Paddock, he's able to pull those strings, otherwise I think you're right, and they do have a lot of problem bringing in a a veteran guy or or a guy that's got a lot of experience and has offers from elsewhere just simply because of that, uh, win loss record that we could potentially see i if, think that's a good point if the team is going to hire externally i would put probably one or two names on my wish list one of them being Braden clamosco from the battlefords north stars because that man wins everywhere he's won as a player at literally every single level he's played including an rbc cup with the humble broncos now like he was the assistant coach with the broncos went to Drumheller, came back to saskatchewan and the balfords have pretty much been unstoppable since he got there you would know, they win the first 30 games of the season? They in were, the they were literally on fire. They loss. swept yeah. the SJHL championship. Like they're they're yeah. un- almost unstoppable. Yeah. Right? So, Until they beat Brooks. <laughs> <laughs> well, even then, I think if they are playing a best of if they ever did play a best of seven, Battlefords would win it. I'm putting it right there. Like they're up there with the best of them this year. Nice. Yeah, well, maybe we'll see what happens there. I mean it's a it's a 10 team tournament now it's an odd kind of set up yeah. obviously with bc leaving uh, yeah. hockey canada but they always had those those battles with manitoba what was it the anavet cup yeah the anavet cup. Yep. yeah those were always good um i i, I just want to say like if, if they bring in a say like a veteran guy like habscheid do, are they looking for maybe somebody with some potential gm experience because even if john isn't coaching like how long is he around as as a gm like like you said he, he's getting up there in age and he's probably you know, he's, he's he's on the back nine. You know, he's yeah. on he's definitely close to retirement here. Either way, so that's the thing. Is it going to be if they go external? Is it going to be a young guy or an older guy with with some potential for uh, a GM kind of slash head coach role? So that'd be interesting to see what happens there. Because um, I think this current staff still has one year of contract. I think Johns is done after this year. So that'd be interesting. Mm-hmm. Maybe some big news this summer. Um, yeah, so, I mean, where do we go from here? Um, it kind of surprises. Like, we, we talked about Suze Dilev. Like, we didn't know what we were getting with him. Nobody knows what you're getting kind of out of those Euros. What's what's another kind of couple of guys or situation where you guys are surprised this year? Drew Sim. 
Drew Sim, yeah. yeah. Especially and, when they picked up McInnes, I, I uh, that that seemed like yeah. the writing on the wall for Sim. Like it, it, it mm-hmm. felt like he was. It's like your afterthought comes into camp with black pads and a white glove. <laughs> <laughs> just, just yeah, I random. I, I, I saw that. Like, what is going on here? Did he think he was gone? I, I don't know what the deal was, but came in. He proved. He proved me wrong. He proved a lot of people wrong. Yeah, absolutely. And and whenever we got a chance to talk with him, we brought up the work that he did in the off season last year, and it sounded like he had a full time job bettering himself. And uh, you know, it was nice to see him get rewarded at times throughout the season. Um, I guess myself, I like Ty Spencer. Um, I think it's someone that can, he's what, five foot six and 130 pounds, but he just, he's, he finds, wet. yeah, <laughs> he's able to win those puck battles. He's got a little bit of offensive upside to him. I know he had a long-term injury this year, but uh, he seems like he's dangerous on the penalty kill. And he seems like he's one of those guys that has that speed and maybe even honestly, I'm going to say it's some strength that some players probably are surprised when they see how small he is. So, uh, I think, you know, he's someone that the Pats can maybe lean on a little bit next year and obviously Zachary Shantz and the way he performed in that opening round series against Saskatoon was just uh, you know you like you said earlier Chris you could see a player kind of starting to blossom a little bit right there maybe it's Sam Aremba's time to you know blossom right I mean I think the you know you started to see a little bit at the tail end of the regular season for Sam Aremba Um, didn't do very much in the playoff series against Saskatoon but you know I think it's time for the local guy to you know just kind of adapt and you know you're you're playing for your hometown club you know it's you know yeah something special but at the same time like you got to produce otherwise you're not going to be here right and that's just the harsh reality of the whl i think it uh you know it'll be his time next year here's hoping but back back to Shan's head, Shan's not got hurt in Edmonton there. Mm-hmm. Where would he have been? He might have been a top six forward. Yeah, we he, don't know because he he's got yeah. some skill. He's got some speed. Seems like he's got the ability. But and he, he missed so much time. Yeah, and one one thing was that was tough. And then to see him come in and turn that notch up for the playoffs like you have to do if you want to have success was just that much more impressive because of the injury issues that he dealt with as well. So uh, if I had to go one, two, three, I'd probably go Zachary Chance first, Ty Spencer second, and, and then definitely Drew Sim just because of what he did last offseason and how much more can he improve this year. Yeah, I think... Shansk in that first goal, you've seen the confidence just yeah. just rise. And then he, he got more opportunity in the top mm-hmm. six. And then he gets another goal and, and stuff like that. So it was it was good to see him step up because, like you said, he missed so much time. We didn't know what we were getting with him at all. So it's a, it's a nice little uh, look ahead for next year mm-hmm. for him. And Aramba, playing at home, maybe there's some pressure. Maybe next year he can he can settle into a role, find find his game. I mean, yeah, he knows what he was traded for, so there's some pressure there as well. Um, coming from Seattle, where he played on a really good team, maybe he could he was you know obviously a bottom six guy, but he's a skilled player, so he's probably going to get a lot more opportunity this coming season. I, I know he fell off it, but he was on NHL Central scouting list a little bit further down earlier on in the season. He wasn't part of the final listings, if I believe or not. So there's obviously some potential there for Samaremba for sure. And it seems like when he plays with confidence, uh, you can see, like you said, the skill that he does have, and he's got uh, some pretty good puck handling ability when he wants to show it. I think he's just got to get into that mindset and play with confidence and, and maybe realize that he's a better player than he was probably given credit for in Seattle because, again, like you said, when you're playing on basically a professional hockey team, you're not going to see as many minutes. When you're playing on a machine, it's pretty yeah, hard to yeah. fit in. a well-oiled machine, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, like he obviously put up big numbers here in Regina. Um, him and Brady Bernie really, uh, really took the city by storm. Yeah. Um, and and Bernie's kind of he's come into his own this year. Like he had 18 goals this year, and and I couldn't remember which one was which because Brady is a really small kid, and uh, and I couldn't remember which one we traded for Remba when we traded the made the Remba trade. And but he's got some skill, some size as well. So I think he he can be a player in this league. Um, and he shows he's got the wheels too. When he wants to, it seems like he just out of nowhere just flies down the ice. But it just it's it's not consistent yeah, enough. I don't he's think just got to learn to 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 understand that he is a skilled hockey player. I think, and and if he plays with that full confidence, then we probably see a twenty goal guy out of him. Honestly, if, if he's with the right uh, the right uh, forward group, they're gonna have to get twenty goals out of him if they want to be competitive yeah, next year. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. He's one of those plus, guys that's gonna plus, have to yeah. step up. Yeah, yeah for sure. Yeah, you look at the returning players here. Um, 
there isn't a lot of goal scoring left, right? That that that's going to be coming back. I mean, you got Howe and Vals. That's those kind of your leaders. Um, and then, like we said, the back end is going to be an issue as well. So there's going to be there's going to be some deals to be made. I think um, some holes to fill. Holes to, to be fill. made for sure. And got to shore up the back end. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. And, and like you said, John, you know, he 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 mentioned he did want to move up. So whether or not what kind of price that is, I don't know. Because he said he's it's what fifty two is the first pick. I think fifty two. Yeah. So no first, no second. So it, it's it's going to be tough. But uh, you look at the guys, the sixteen year olds. I mean, there's some skill there. There's at least some potential coming, like we we hadn't seen in the last few years. There's actually some high end skill coming. You look at Zachari- uh, Zacharias, um, Temple, Almon. Those guys have some some upside. That's not going to be much for next year. But Zacharias will be seventeen. Yeah, is he gonna is he gonna be a twenty goal scorer? 15? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Coming, I, I don't see it coming from Triple A to, um, to the like WHL. Like that's a pretty sizable step, right? Yeah. And like, yeah, we've seen him play one or two or three games for the Pats, but like, yeah, those, yeah. those were his fifteen, those yeah. Too, so it's it's really hard to gauge that. So like, I think if given the opportunity, I think he can put together a pretty solid season if he's with the club you know, the whole time, right? But it's about getting those opportunities, getting that, getting on the ice, right? You can't do anything by sitting on the bench. Totally. So. I agree, yeah. Um, I think two guys, sorry. No, uh, go ahead. They're probably going to want to see more from our Mateo Michaels and Braden Barnett. I think that's probably two guys that are for sure is on the team next year, barring any trades to move up in the draft. And uh, those are guys that are going to have to go from – you know, energy players to not obviously point per game players, but maybe be relied on to be the secondary scorers on this team. Uh, if you still have Tanner Howe and Alexander Suzdalev. Yeah. Get, get 10 goals out of those guys each at least. Yeah. It'd be nice. 10, 10 to 15. Yeah. Better, better for sure. than two or three yeah. or whatever they had. They'll have to be, they'll have to be the secondary scorers. If you still have Tanner Howe and Alexander Suzdalev for sure. Everybody's going to step up. Yeah, yep. um, you, a guy like Braxton Whitehead, he needs to take another step. Him too. Yeah, um, I think he maybe focused more on the defensive side of the game this year, and that maybe took away from his offense because he had a really good back half of the season two years ago, and it just didn't translate into this season, unfortunately, offensively for him. But he did mention that he he was working on his complete game, working on that faceoff kind of stuff, defensive side of the game, but. But with his sickness at the beginning of the season, probably delayed everything for him. That so, didn't help either. Yeah. yeah. Is he the guy that wears the C next year? Honestly, is he? Is, or is he in the mix to wear the C next he's, year? He's the only returning letter wearer. Yeah. Right. That's right. Yeah. yeah. That's yeah. True. <laughs> so, um, you, you a guy like him, uh, like your your leadership group. Who do you who do you kind of think is going to be there? Like a how? As of right now, there's only two twenty year old returnees for yeah. like skater for or a skater guys so yeah stringer berg yeah and a house probably do you, do you see either one of those guys as a captain stringer who knows what his health he's he seems to be always injured like it's not his fault but no. it seems like he's always injured yeah he's had to deal berg, berg is consistently playing pretty much every game all the time but is he a captain i don't know i don't know anything about the i'd give it to berg i'm not gonna lie like he he played really well i thought you know yeah. and Totally. You know, granted, like he was a top four defenseman on this team, but wasn't in the top, you know, unit by any means because that was Bateman and Svozel. But like, you know, he, you know, played really well, kept the puck out of the net, you know, a good amount of times, right? And if I remember right, like, you know, he was, you know, just kind of level par, like wasn't a minus player by any means, right? So I'd give it to Parker Berg. I mean, I guess, as you mentioned, like he played 68 games. Yeah. Right, like yeah. he's always in the lineup. He's always there, consistent presence. And you know, if he's going to have to lead the back end next year, is the twenty-year-old coming back? So it's yeah, Berg. I'd give it to Berg. Berg was a zero on the plus-minus. Like yeah. Even, a lot yeah. of yeah, even, even. F, <laughs> even. A lot of people don't like that stat, but when ninety percent of your team is in the minuses, it's not a it's well, not a bad number. Like Bateman plus thirteen, Sfozel plus twenty-seven. Like holy crap, but. Like Tanner Brown was a minus four, right? Corbin yeah. Vaughn minus fifteen. You know, Leighton Feist a minus twenty nine, right? Like, you know, yeah, um, yeah. There's three to be level par. I think that's pretty good. Yeah, three or four guys above zero. 
So it's not a lot. Um, where do we go from here? Uh, I guess we haven't touched on Bedard much yet. <laughs> not that we have to, but... <laughs> what hasn't been said about Bedard? I know, right? Literally everything has been said pretty yeah. much. I, I love how his final home game, he gets the game-winning goal yeah. in game six. Yeah. You know, granted it was a bad change by Saskatoon, but, like, who cares? That was a really nice pass by Svozel. He comes all the way back, and Bedard goes on the partial break, and yeah. I lose my mind on the TV broadcast. And it was <laughs> so fun. What, is, it's a... It's a week from today that we find out where he's going. Is it is it May sixth or May eighth or something? The NHL draft lottery. Is, I think it's May eighth. May eighth. Yeah. Okay. Something like that. Yeah, yeah. So we're a little over is, a week away. Does anybody have a team they'd like to see him go to? I I like to see him go to Anaheim because I know he's good friends with Mason McTavish and uh, obviously Trevor Zegris is there. I think that's a team that's going to take a big step next year. But um, and I hate to say it, I just I don't want to see Columbus. I don't want to see I don't Arizona. See Columbus either. Um, Arizona is maybe a team that's getting more attention than they used to because of the arena situation that's and the stuff. Only reason. But <laughs> yeah, I mean, and not it, trading the uh, what, what's what's his, what you call him the guy they didn't trade until this year finally. Chikrin? Oh, was it Chikrin? Chikrin. Jacob yeah, Chikrin, Jacob. yeah. Finally trade yeah. him after he asked I, to be I, traded. I, I think Anaheim would be an, an amazing fit for him because it's just those two guys in a team that's probably going to be a lot better as soon as next year. But I guess we'll see. It's obviously going to be number one, and Anaheim has, what, 25% chance only now? because Columbus has the 25% 20, chance. Columbus has it? Okay. Uh, so is, Ana- it, is, it, is it Columbus or is it? No, it's I think Columbus. It's Anaheim's number one now. Oh, Anaheim yeah. Because okay, Columbus so won Anaheim's that second last right. game. Yeah. So they yeah. moved right. out of... Yeah. Last. So Anaheim, Anaheim has the highest. Yeah, yeah. Highest Selfishly, cost. I do kind of want to see him go to Columbus. And yeah, maybe it's not great for like the marketing side of things, but like Svozel is part of that organization, right? Like he'll, he'll, Bedard would probably be centering a line with Johnny Gaudreau and Patrick Kleine. Like, yeah. I don't watch a lot of NHL at all. But I think they have the most talent, I think, Columbus out of those yeah. fine, kind of bottom groups. Um, like you said, Drew. They underperformed a lot this year. They yeah. did. Yeah. Um, Anaheim has the the young talent, and they're an up and coming team. Whereas Columbus is just uh, whatever. And then Chicago seems to be a bit of a dumpster fire. You know, that, I mean, can he pull that franchise out of the out of the ashes? Since you know they've traded away Kane, Taze is not coming back. You know, they they're at the very bottom. I just things. hope he goes to a place where he can get a little bit of peace. So he's not mm. quite, he'll be in the spotlight everywhere he goes, but he'll get a little bit of peace. Like not Vancouver, where he's going to be. Hounded twenty four seven. If he goes to if he Montreal. goes to Chicago, Columbus, if he goes to Montreal, it'd be probably yes. worse because he doesn't speak French. I don't think no. so. That would make it even worse. <laughs> but if he goes to Anaheim or Columbus or Chicago, like a Philadelphia, he can be the superstar, but he can be left alone. Anonymous. Like they'll, a bit. They'll, they'll leave him. He'll be just a normal, normal teenage kid walking down the street. A lot of people won't recognize him, which would be probably a nice little change for him. Yeah, absolutely. But I, I know he likes the spotlight. But it, it it'll be nice to not have the yeah. the, the, the the craziness like the Vancouver. <laughs> Without mentioning some of the stories we heard this year, it was yeah. pretty nuts here in, in oh, the yeah. Green in City. Yeah. So oh, yeah. uh, getting to talk to his mom a little bit, it was absolutely insane. But uh, he handled it with grace and professionalism. And uh, I'm in my 30s, and I don't think I could handle it like that if I was ever in the spotlight. He, so that was incredible. He is mature way beyond his years. Yeah. Like just talking to him all the time, like it, it just. He he he. Well, he has to be mature, right? I mean, some guys you've seen guys that have have had issues at a young age with the the spotlight, but uh, he seems to handle it very well. Yeah. What seventeen year old acts like that? Like none, <laughs> no, but zero, right? Like, <laughs> yeah. I look back to when I was seventeen, like I was nothing compared. No, I, like yeah, he, like, he, he, obviously he he's done so many interviews, but even the way he articulates himself and and answers these questions, like. You ask the other 17s on the team, 16-year-olds, they have five-word answers, two-second responses, right? It's, it's tough to get They look stuff. like deer in headlights lots yeah. of times. <laughs> yeah, they do, <laughs> right? I remember interviewing Leighton Feist at the first camp, so he's like, whatever, 14, 15, and I was pretty new at this too, so we were both terrible. Like, I'm just going to say <laughs> it. Like, I had terrible questions. He didn't have very good answers either. It was, it was a tough go, but uh, yeah, just – just his his demeanor and stuff off the ice it just seems um crazy how much he's handled the spotlight and and like you said drew the off ice issues that have have come up here unfortunately but uh um it's it's wild to see and then go 
on the ice and do what he does on the ice. Like it, it's unbelievable. We haven't, none of us have seen any, anything like that in person. I don't think we'll ever see it again, to be honest. Nothing, no, nothing like that. It's, it was just nuts. The, the things he was able to do and the attention that was drawn to him when he was on the ice and, um, man, and still score right. and the still, goals. Like yeah. you, or you set look, up beautiful passes yeah, to different you, players. You look at those goals against Sastoon, like he, he, it was one on two, what, three or four times and he still scored. Yeah. That like, one backdoor pass in the playoffs there when Tanner Howe hammered home that one yeah, timer, yeah. that was just incredible. It was like through a complete forest of legs and right through the top of the crease and, I don't even know how he saw that. And <laughs> we talk so much about his shooting and goal scoring, and then we see some of his playmaking abilities, and it's like, okay, he's probably a 70-point player in the National Hockey League next year, just after seeing what he did in the playoffs. Yeah. Bedard uh, did score 71 goals, but, again, 72 assists too, right? Yeah. And, like, not not a lot of those were just shooting and then guys jamming at the rebound. Like, those were yes. passes. Yeah. Lots, of, lots of primary assists. Yeah, Ooh. tons of primary yeah. assists. Yeah. The one number that stuck out to me from him was when he came back from the World Juniors and he put up, I think it was 72 points in 28 games or something. Like, that's just mind-boggling. That's yeah. like when, Doubles when you talk total. about stuff that Wayne Gretzky did, and obviously you can't compare them because it's a different era but and different leagues, but like 72 points in 28 or 29 games, that's... some. I can't even do that on Be a Pro Mode in NHL 23, so that's just insane. <laughs> yeah, and then to, and to have at least some skill around them where they can finish. Like you, you said that, that how goal, like it was just off the goal line, like yeah. to, for him to one time that home, that that's, that's impressive as well. And I noticed his, his playmaking right in the hub there. Like you, you could tell that he, he had a complete game. Everybody raved about a shot, but when I was watching him play there, it was like, you can tell his playmaking is, is above everybody's level. I remember one, one game, it got dumped in and he, he was the first guy to the puck and he looked behind him before he got to the end boards and Denemy was wide open in front of the net and he grabbed the puck off the boards, passed it right out in front of him and Denemy hammered it home. The goalie didn't even realize that it was in the back of his net. Like it was that quick. Yeah. And and you see what happened with Denemy after Bedard left for under 18s. He, ha- he was a goal a game with Bedard. He scored one goal, I think, in the six or seven games, uh, the last six or seven games without Bedard. Like he, he was nothing almost right that's one thing too that that he has to his credit too is there's some players that are extremely skilled like that but for whatever reason they don't make players around them better and like you said he obviously has done that throughout his time here in Regina and I think that's something that NHL teams are just going to be salivating over is okay not only is he a superstar player but he makes guys around him better and I think a lot of that is the playmaking ability absolutely yeah there's a lot of guys that you know the, the tension is drawn to them obviously because they have the skill but they can't they can't set a guy up or they can't they're one dimensional where he has they can't take the pressure or they can't. He can mm-hmm. he can take the pressure where he gets three or four at him and he still gets the still gets nice passes through yeah so. it's going to be obviously a, a tougher goal at the next level when he's playing against some men but i mean give him a couple of years and and i'm sure he'll be but he'll be playing with good players yeah, yeah. nhlers so it's it's not like he's going to be playing with a bunch of young kids as well so he'll if he does end up in columbus say he's gonna have goudreau he's gonna have line a goes to anaheim he's got zegris and mctavish so he's he's got some guys that are he's, he's gonna have some guys to play with definitely and he won't have as big of a role of course and he probably won't be killing penalties in this first year or anything like that but still he's gonna be there for offense and that's his job <laughs> so. yeah yeah most definitely um I th- actually think coming from the Western Hockey League is going to be a decent, like not an easy transition for him, but an easier transition than, say, you know, the OHL. Because, you know, the WHL is a very physical game. We saw that Saskatoon series. Like it was a grind. Yeah, just just watch the playoffs night. right now, the NHL yeah. playoffs. Everybody, like every single game has been like super physical and everyone wants to, looks like they want to murder each other. And he's, he's used to that. Right? Yeah. Like, playing playing those uh, seven games against Saskatoon and the, the the last couple, well, two of the last three regular season games, so it's a he's he's able to grind it out. He's not afraid to shy away from contact and stuff either. So and that's one part of his game that I don't think gets enough credit. You yeah, know, that he mm-hmm. is willing to take those hits and he's willing to hit back. Yeah. He's got he's got a little bit of sandpaper to his game. 
there's throughout the playoff series, I noticed a couple times he's skating to the bench and Saskatoon players are changing and he comes up behind them and pokes them in the back a little bit or tries to kick them a little bit. And he's, he's got that sandpaper to his game as well. That like Ryan said, you don't really notice because you know, he's scoring six, seven points a game. Sometimes they don't show those highlights on TSM. No, definitely not. They <laughs> not, only show, not in 2023. Nope. <laughs> they only show the goals, that's for sure. But, yeah, you, you kind of almost need that, right? Because you're going to have so much tension. There's going to be – guys are going to be out there to hit you, right, at, especially at the next level. They're just looking to, not to run you but to, to throw you off your game, be physical, finish their checks. So it's nice that he does have that in his game and he's, he's willing to accept that and, and push back. Tom said, his dad said, there's going to be guys that want to show him that he doesn't belong there yet next year. That was one thing he said to, to myself and uh, Dante to carry it was, well, there's going to be guys that want to prove, no, you shouldn't be here yet. So I think, yeah, he, he takes a lot of abuse next year, probably for sure. But I'm sure wherever he goes, he's going to have guys that are going to be like, you belong here. Absolutely. So it, it'll yeah. be, it'll Looking be a, out for you. a two-way yeah. street. Yeah, yeah. Thing, so the only knock I think everybody seems to have is he's, he's not super big. He's not, a, he's not small, but he's not big his build reminds me of Sidney crosby's a little exactly bit. He's, yeah yeah he's, he's kind of stocky. Sh- stocky almost a little bit but yeah but you see like Sidney crosby like he had like the biggest legs like it's all about that core strength yeah. you know um but ours work in that way so and i likened his game as well to crosby like he's not a mcdavid like don't even compare him to mcdavid they have two totally different games yeah. So, uh, I, obviously, there's a lot of talk because McDavid was the last exceptional status player. Bedard's the next one, but they're they're nowhere near the same similar game. I, I likened it to Crosby and, and kind of the both the goal scoring and the, the playmaking ability that they both have. All right, I guess uh, looking into next year, um, like we said, there's, there's a lot of holes to fill, especially on the back end. Uh, does the team make some trades? Do they do they want to go into a full rebuild? Do they just want to retool? I don't know. What uh, what what kind of your guys' thoughts? I think they could be in a wait and see mode until about the deadline. Um, if they're you know out of the playoffs and things are looking pretty bleak, then I think it's time to sell. And there will be plenty of teams that are willing to pay. And uh, you know like. I'd like I'd like to look at Prince Albert uh, as a team that might be able to buy. Um, you know, they showed some flashes this year of things to come, and they got a still a pretty young core there. You know, like they got a pretty solid goaltender in Chaika that uh, I know Kevin kind of likes, and you know, yeah, like I, I isn't he twenty next year? Is he twenty? I think year? I think he's twenty next year. So he, so he's still be, starter, maybe, right? but he's he's a two. He'd be a two hit. Yeah, he's the import import. So yeah. But well, you look at the Pats D for next year. You got Berg, Feist, Corbin Vaughn, and that's the veterans. Yep. Then you got Carter Herman, who played, what, 25 games? Plazier played a dozen or so. Colton Bridgman played seven or eight. And, and that's playoffs. it. And, 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 and the but, game, but yeah. that's it. Yeah. That's their, their defensive depth. That doesn't look very doesn't look too yes. promising. <laughs> it, it almost seems just because of Connor Bedard departing, and it seems like the end of an era. It doesn't just seem like appropriate to enter a rebuild. And I don't know. That's speculating a little bit, but I just don't know where they go from here. Just because it seems like one door is closing on the Connor Bedard era, and maybe it's time to do that. And I guess we know for sure if we see an Alexander Suzdalev or a Tanner Howe trade. I guess that that's when we know for sure that okay, this is. Uh, you know the beginning of a, a full teardown and a full rebuild, but and I, and I don't know when that will come. If it'll be right away here, or if, like Ryan said, maybe they'll wait and see and then do it uh, next off season. But uh, uh, it just seems appropriate with the Connor Bedard era coming to an end for whatever reason. Yeah, like uh, is Souza back next year? I think he is. Um, he's still got obviously some defensive work to his game obviously the offensive game is there but i i don't think he's but are they going to have him as an offensive player wherever he goes is he just gonna be offense or is he gonna be defense as well i think he'll just be an offensive guy he'll be yeah. a top six guy he's not going to kill penalties no never he's no. not going to block shots that's just not his game no he'll but i'm there to get points and score goals but does do the washington capitals want him to work on a little more of that here rather than in the hl next year or are they just gonna like he can go next year to the hl but I guess it all depends on their kind of organizational situation. 
but I, I see him back. Um, and then it's it's the import draft. Do they pick up somebody else? Do they still have Kemmel on the list? We none of the stuff we know. But he's an offensive guy. Maybe he comes in and helps out. Or do they look at? And according to the in the system, their two draft picks from last year aren't part of the system anymore. So yeah. the Harabo goalie. And yeah, that the, was weird. The other guy. Yeah, I can't remember what his name was. H- Hof or no? Yeah, a- Luca Hour. Uh, Hour. Luca Hour. <laughs> yeah, um, <laughs> can't remember his name. But Kemmel's still on the list. It seems. We ha- we don't know how all that stuff works, obviously, but uh, maybe they if he's available, maybe he comes. Maybe they look at a, a, an older defenseman, like a nineteen, somebody that can plug right in with that's basically a free instead of having to make a trade. I think um, you might end up with a guy like Jan Zaplatol or uh, Matei Troyovsky, those kind of guys that aren't the greatest. <laughs> didn't turn out, but. <laughs> Um, yeah, like you said, the the D is is real thin on experience. Um, the signing of Aaron Kristovanic, I think, is is key. He he looked pretty good, or sounded like his stats and his he was Triple A defenseman of the year, Manitoba. defenseman of the year. So, I think he was playoff MVP as well. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. Um, so that you know that that's that's this guy that could probably step in. Is he going to be top four guy? Probably not, but you never know. He seems like an offensive guy at the AAA level, but does that translate into the Western yeah. Hockey League yeah. level like we were talking with uh, Zacharias? I wonder if Corbin Vaughn can take a big step and, and kind of be a, not like obviously a surprise to the extent that Suzdalev was, but maybe a pleasant surprise and turn into a really, really reliable defenseman back there for him. I think that's key too to maybe if they decide to do a full teardown or not is if all of a sudden someone like Corbin Vaughn comes in and has taken a huge step. Especially when he's the get the third most games played by <laughs> yeah, the defense. That's so crazy yeah. to think. I, yeah. I'm expecting to be a top four defenseman just yeah. because of that. Yeah, because there's nobody else, right? As yeah, long as he doesn't uh, get suspended anymore. Yeah, yeah, he's got to stay clean. Yeah. Both of them, both the Vaughn boys. Yeah, I love them, but they, they gotta, they gotta. They're right on that to- edge. Tone right? it down a teeny tiny bit. Yeah. Um, but uh, as a defenseman, I think they need some some defensive defensemen, right? Like they they need to work on keeping the puck in the net. Like I said, the last couple of years have, has been tough, even with experienced D men. And they need to power up the quarterback too. That's true because they don't have anything. Well, Feist, I think took Feist a, to, felt like he took a step back this year. Yeah, I yeah, think that, Feist was fair. that guy was supposed to be that guy, but he definitely I don't think has has progressed as much as they want him to. I mean, he's going to be. 19 this year it, this is his this is make, make or break, or break it right yeah. here right like you, you look at the evans and then you look at Svozo. like they those guys you could see every year they took big steps Svozo took giant steps within the season we've seen him like i remember the first time he was here his defensive game was pretty suspect when he first came but by the end of this year man he was the best d-man on the team by i far. think the world juniors really helped him i think he got the the, the swagger yeah I think he got him the swagger there. Yeah, so. and then he was able to produce offensively as well as play sound in his own end. For being a rover, yeah, he yeah, played, yeah. He played, he played yeah. pretty well <laughs> <Yeah>. defensively. <laughs> this is kind of the first time in a while that the Pats might not have that one reliable quarterback defenseman on the power play because they had Connor Hobbs and they had Riker Evans and they had Stanislav Svozl. Josh Mahura. Yeah, Josh. Right. Yeah. It's a problem they haven't had for a while, <laughs> so yeah. it'll be interesting to see what they're able to do with that. Yeah, and then uh, overall, it, it like you said, I, I don't think it's a playoff team next year. Obviously, they they not squeaked in, but they they snuck into the playoffs here with Bedard and Svozel, probably two of the top five, ten players in the whole league, and uh, losing them is it's going to be it's going to be tough to uh, you can't fill either of those voids, but. Uh, it, it, it's going to be a non-playoff year as of right now. The way the roster yeah. looks, and I is that would, would is, is that why they move Tanner Howe if they do? Because it's his draft year, and you know you, you play on an underwhelming team. He could be draft worth a ton. Year. Yeah, he could be worth a ton too. And but it all depends. Do they want to put him somewhere good for his draft? A lot year? of it depends on the prices this year because yeah. last year everybody overpaid because of so steep. Seattle's yeah. and like those those trades were crazy. And yeah, will and that happen this year? Because the Western Hockey League's not hosting it. No, it is always they're so always a little more expensive prices. when mm-hmm. your league is hosting the yeah. World Cup. Now, was it the right decision to keep it art? We didn't discuss that. I think so. Uh, you know, from a Regina Pats perspective, I think so because you don't get into the playoffs without him. You know, you don't get as much attention, or you know, if if you're Saskatoon, you're happy that Regina kept it art, right? Because yeah. they made a million dollars plus on that series, easily, hundred oh, yeah. percent, easily, right? 
You so, look at the attendance numbers. They, they've dropped off significantly since, yeah. since it's Red Deer. If you're going to trade him, out of spite, should have traded him to Seattle. Because Kamloops was begging for him. <laughs> I don't know if Seattle had anything him. left after all those exactly. deals they made. Much left. Like the Gunther trade? Ooh, man. Yeah. Well, right. again, do, does Seattle make that trade? If make the Gunther true. trade, if that's true. they have Bedard. Right? That's true. And probably but they, not. They, they made the Gunther trade with conditions. Yeah. They might have begged, you they can't, might have begged them to not tr- send Gunther back. Yeah. <laughs> they might have been like, please don't send it back. Yeah, yeah. We, we just made another deal. They could have dealt his rights too. Like they could have, For sure. They could have passed them too. So. Yeah. I know earlier on in the year, and Ryan can attest to this because I would send him messages all the time about how they have to trade Bedard because they're having an <laughs> underwhelming year. Because I was like with you, yeah. Kevin, I was like a 45 plus win team coming into this year. And there was time after time again where I said they got to trade him because it's not working out for whatever reason. And uh, But as the year went on, I kind of realized, okay, like we said earlier, you're never going to see this again. So you almost have to be a little bit selfish and keep him here. And when he expressed that he wanted to be a Regina Pat and he, want, and he loved the city and he wanted to be here, I think that kind of sealed it. And you had to keep him. And uh, yeah, I know they were out in the first round, but they played against the Saskatoon team that was a 101-point team. And I think they did pretty well. So I, I think my, my men mentality on that kind of changed a little bit but I'm not going to lie early on in the year when they were kind of a 500 team even under 500 a little bit I thought it was time to to make that move but uh, and and what was the point that I said I said well they've they traded John Tavares back in the day and he was an exceptional status player so anybody can get traded but you know the Pats were like 30 seconds away from going up three to one in Saskatoon yeah so and and at that point we discussed it we're like if Regina would have won that game they would have won the series but then you look at what Saskatoon did against I, Red Deer. I, I think that built Saskatoon back. Like that got them going, got them, yeah. their mentality up. Because like the, this, this series isn't, too, what do you say, this series isn't 2 nothing or whatever early on. But I think if the Pats would have won that game, it would have been 3-1. I think it would have been done. I think Saskatoon three would nothing. have. 3-0. Or 3 nothing. Yeah, yeah, there's a 3 nothing or 3-1. Because right? they, 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 they had overtime. Yeah, yeah, Saskatoon right. would have. Would have the worst lead in hockey. Yeah. 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 And that's when I knew I was wrong earlier on in the year when I said that uh, – Maybe it's time to, to look at trading them because, yeah, they were just a goal or two away from winning that series, absolutely. Shane Wright got traded for a pile this year, and look how that turned out. <laughs> First <Yeah>. round. Yeah. <laughs> Done. Yeah. Swept. So, um, but I think I think the team was pretty pretty fine with what they had. They, they knew they weren't going deep. Um, John said, yeah, we think – we thought we could have won a round, right? So saying that, I, I t- kind of take that as in, okay, we weren't, we knew we weren't going to go all the way, but we we had some hope to to do a little bit, and and they were that close to to winning that round, and you never know what happened. I mean, it's Winnipeg, it's prob they're probably going to take a loss in that series, but I mean, to have a couple rounds of experience that wouldn't have been bad for next year, even if they don't make the playoffs. Hypothetical. Say Regina catches Lethbridge for fifth, and it's a Regina Moose draw playoff series. Do you think Regina wins that series? Yes. Kevin, I know it was all over that, but the way Moose draw played, I because we didn't know what the goal thing is. It doesn't matter. Was I, th- I think the pass would have won that series. A sweep, and then they really gave Winnipeg some problems. So I don't know if they performed like that against the Pats, but I was surprised at, at the way Moose draw came out. I thought that first round series was going to be the one that went seven, not the Saskatoon Regina one, if I was being honest. Yeah, and for that one to go four games only, it was very, very surprising. Um, but Unger stepped in, missing all that time, and he didn't miss a beat. He looked real well in that Lethbridge series. I still I, think the Pats would have won that series. Yeah, I okay. think so too, just because Regina would have had seven home games. <laughs> yeah. Pretty much. When you think about it. And like, and they took Saskatoon to seven, and Saskatoon's a better team than Moose Jaw yeah. overall. So. Well, is Sask. Moose Jaw, you know, they they weren't as good because they missed those two guys for so long, right? That made a huge difference in their record. But even before. I'm not even talking they, the record. The, the Saskatoon, I think, is, you a, think better is a better team, team? overall. Even, and even I, before that suspension situation, like, I thought Moose Jaw was underperforming this They year. were really they, underperforming. They, they did, yeah. Like, they were. I, I heard everyone say they were going to be competing with Winnipeg for tops of the division. It's like, well, no. They were underwhelming for sure. <laughs> they were yeah. very underwhelming. Like, and I, Regina did have better success against them than Saskatoon overall in the season. So It would have been a fun series. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. It would have been. <laughs> but it didn't happen, unfortunately. Losing to losing to Edmonton, I think, in the regular season kind of put the nail in the coffin yeah. for the, the, that yeah. potential. Yeah. That was a tough night. Well, <laughs> that was that. Well, like you know, you look at that weekend where you had the top three teams in the East, and you win 
three of those, right? You know, you get you get four points out of the out of that weekend, and then you turn around and lay a cookie down on Wednesday against the, the Oil Kings. It's like you did all that for nothing. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And then you go on the road, you lose a game you probably shouldn't have to Lethbridge, and you get stomped on by Medicine Hat. Right. Like that just undoes. All Everything. Yeah, yeah, those losses right. against Medicine Hat, there was a couple of them that were real tough. Yeah. Like Medicine Hat, yes, they improved in the back half of the season. They 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 had a nice, you know, a nice um progression to their their season, but yeah. They were so close to making the playoffs. That's yeah. going to be a good team next year. I think Just so. Yeah. Last year they were what an 11 win team. They were yeah, yeah. like you said right Chris, the they bottom. showed some really good flashes, especially in the second half. Yeah. Willie yeah, makes team that team work so hard too. Like they just don't stop. Yeah. 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 Um, all right. Uh, what else? Any more thoughts on this season, next season? Something we'll never forget with, uh, you know, there's lots of good players on that team. There's lots of good characters, but it's something we'll never forget in, in Regina was, was having a player like Connor Bedard. And uh, selfishly, I'm so happy that I got involved and, and was able to do some games on the radio this year because, Man, in 20 years, when his NHL career is over, I think we'll we'll be retiring his jersey maybe even sooner than that because obviously Everly's is already retired. So I think we just it's got to be hammered home that it was a, a special few years, especially this past year. And uh, you know, like you said, Kevin, probably we never see something like this again in Regina. Too bad they didn't have more people watching him the first half of this year and all of last year. Like, I, I don't know what the deal was. I know people were upset about the ticket prices, blah, blah, blah. But even if you go once or twice to see him, what's yeah. what's 40 bucks here or there kind of thing? Well, right? I, I know my, my mom and dad were down visiting and from Saskatoon, and my dad's a longtime Blades fan because, you know, I grew up there. And uh, he comes down, and uh, he was sitting across from the broadcasting booth, and Bedard scored a goal, and Svozel scored a goal, and he's standing up clapping and cheering. So <laughs> uh, he quickly realized how special of, of a couple players we had here in Regina, and he was a, a longtime Saskatoon Blades fan. So I think that, to me, right there, when I looked across the rink when I was doing the game and saw him cheering, for the past was like okay it's there's some special guys here this year and we can't forget about the, the season that it was even though it maybe wasn't to what expectations were it was still like okay we had someone that's going to turn out to be a, a like someone like a Sidney Crosby or someone like a Connor McDavid on our team and uh, yeah I don't I don't know if we ever see it again and to have almost 15,000 people in Saskatoon and probably yeah. 10,000 of them were there to watch Bedard yeah yeah not even yeah. necessarily the Pats or the Blades I just wanted to see Bedard well, you look at that, the, the game Calgary, the too. Calgary game. That's what I was just about to say. You know, he he scores in the shootout. Yeah, there's cheering. Yeah, okay, he scored. Everybody's there to see him. And then Sim makes the the final save in the shootout. And there was cheering. And there was cheering. Like, <laughs> yeah, the place kind of went crazy because the Pats won. So they were there to see the Pats as well. Like, yeah, they were there cheering for Bedard and his team. Exactly it right. Was almost a home game everywhere they went. It it was for a point. Yeah, right. Yeah, even, from even that, in the BC trip too. From the BC yeah. trip on, that's when it started. Yeah. The yeah. only yeah, the only game that I'd argue that like wasn't was that Kamloops game when like the fans are chanting like Logan's better. Yeah, yeah. Just because, well, of course. Again, just, just Kamloops because. was up nine one. Right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know so. And also, like, John made some pretty spicy comments that day, too, with yeah. the Kamloops media. Yeah, that, was, that was so fun. That was funny. <laughs> that was. Yeah. Um, but one, one of the problems, though, I noticed with the crowds is that people weren't paying attention when Bedard was on the ice. And then as soon as Bedard came on, Bedard came on the ice, they'd pay attention. Yeah. Or that even happened up in the press box from a certain former sports journalist. <laughs> that he would be doing something on his computer, and then he's like, let me know when Bedard's on the ice. I'm like, oh, he's on the ice. That's, yeah. That's and then crazy. he'd go back and type, and then he'd be, oh. <laughs> so and, and I know a couple of people that that uh, uh, that did to go to a few games that used to go to a lot of games and they said the crowd it was just in certain Bedard obviously right they they weren't there to watch the whole game per se but I mean when there are when it is this, the big crowds that were there at the second half of the season is obviously part time fans not I'm not saying part time fans part time fans part time fans there to see Bedard yeah and so they they were really only interested in him which. It is what it is, and, and maybe they can, the team can somehow keep those that interest somehow going into yeah. next year. I was going to say, I wonder if there's some people in Regina that discovered their love of hockey this year because of Connor Bedard, and you know they're going to start coming back to games uh, a couple times throughout the year now because you know they never really watched junior hockey or the Pats before, and 
they come and they see the atmosphere that the Brand Center has. And uh, obviously that was heightened with Connor Bedard, but all of a sudden they took a love to it and took a love to hockey. And now maybe they can retain some of that. And, uh, you know, but, that's um, going to be up to, to the marketing team, but uh, I think they can. Unfortunately, a lot of people are going to go on the Ticketmaster site and say, oh, I want tickets for this game and then see how much it is. And they're going to be like, uh, I'll yeah. buy the WHL package and I'll watch all the games on TV. Yeah. And I know like... Or I'll watch NHL, whatever, you, you, or just you, stay home. <laughs> you, you could go to a Blades game with four people for the price that you could go to a Pats game for two people. And maybe that changes because <laughs> there's a, a player that's not there next year. But uh, that I was think, the one surprise, yeah. I think they have to change it up. Like there was has eight, to be eight, a kid's ticket. It was $8 to go yeah. for kids to go elsewhere. And that, like, that's the problem. People know. aren't bringing their kids to, and paying $40 for I mean, them to run around the rink yeah right. or go home halfway through the game when the yeah. kid gets tuckered out or whatever yeah like, especially in this time when it's three hundred dollars for groceries for two people and yeah exactly two hundred dollars like, for a tank of gas people are, stuff, are really yeah. you know very very tight with their extra money yeah. they're 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 spending money so you can go do a couple things with this money or we go to one pats game right it, it's it, it's a tough not a tough sell, but it's a tough market, right? The economy is, is a tough situation right now. When I was a kid, Regina was not a fun city in the sense that you couldn't do a lot as a, a teenager or as a, you know, like a, you know, preteen, I guess, even. Like, with your family or whatever. Like, you, you, there was a couple mini golf places, but there was Pats and there was Riders. And they were, they were always there. Now, there's, I think, so much more to do, right? Like, you have you know, places where you can just go and hang out and play games and have fun. You, there's like multiple different mini golf places. There's multiple movie theaters you can go to now. Like it's just more accessible to get to those places now for the young, you know, group of people to do. Uh, and so, you know, there's a lot of competing things for that entertainment dollar. And I think the Pats and the riders, if I'm being honest with you, both need to do a better job of marketing their product and you know getting people out and i think a lot of it has to do with coverage there's so lacking like the coverage in this city was so lacking this year when when rob vanstone left the leader post that hurt that hurt them yeah. a lot i think but there were games in the early half of the season when chris couldn't come and vanstone wasn't at the press box i was the only person in the press box wow and i was doing game recaps for dante <laughs> So, like, I'm not even really covering. Like, I'm covering them, but I'm not covering them. Yeah. And I'm the only person in the press box. And then there was access games where I was the only other person. It, it's it, yeah. it's mind-blowing. Like, I'd yeah. say 80% of the time, it's Rob and I at, as media. And, the, like, the radio was there once in a while. TV was there once in a while. Mm-hmm. I mean, they do stuff during the week at practice because that's their working hours, right? But if you're a sports reporter in this town – and you're not working evenings and weekends, then what are you covering, right? You're, if you're a sports reporter, you're kind of expected to work evenings and weekends because yeah. that's when sports happens. Nothing's happening during the day. No, nobody's playing during the day. The Riders aren't playing the, during the day. The Pats aren't playing during the day of the week, right? So it, it's kind of sad to see that, especially when Bedard was here and there's how many eyes on him. Like how many requests was he getting out of Regina? Like he, he did – Interviews after he was done with us. He, he went live on TNT one night. He was on San Jose right before he came and talked to us one night. Like, he was constantly doing stuff out of Regina. But, it, and you've seen the media come in the playoffs, obviously. There was there was too many people for the press box. But, I mean, like, and some people got hurt that they couldn't sit there. Well, where were you all season? If you were here all season, we got a seat up here. Exactly. Right? Mm-hmm. So, it, it's kind of sad to see, but... Uh, Especially when you have Bedard here. Yeah. Like, I could have seen, like, when I first started doing Dubneck, where it was just Greg Carter and I, and because te- it was after the Memorial Cup, so the team, there wasn't that much interest. I understand that. But to see even last year wasn't great, and then see this year when Bedard is doing what he's doing and, and people weren't coming out to cover him, it was kind of kind of sad. But you watch, like, the nighttime news when the Pats play. You might get a 20-second clip. Like, oh, Bedard scored, or this is the game-winning goal. That's it. Like, there's no interviews, no anything hardly anymore. Like, it, I remember watching the, the late-night sports, the uh, STV days, back in the STV days. Mm-hmm. And they had, like, the, I can't remember what the show was called, but with uh, Ro- uh, Rob Reimer and uh, Woodsy. I can't remember what it was called. Yeah, sports like line. Sports, sports line, line. Yeah. 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 It was after the sports, or and after it was, the news. It was right? after the news. It was, yeah, like, yeah. A, a half-hour half show, show. Yeah. talking about local local sports. 
Pats, Riders, Rams, whatever. I miss that. Like, there's nothing. There's nothing now. But like we were saying before we started doing this, the whole media landscape is changing, evolving every minute, it seems. So, but I know where I work. We're literally on a skeleton crew. <laughs> It's no excuse, but it's it's crazy. Yeah, the it's nice changed. to see that Leader Post did hire somebody. They brought in Taylor Shire. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that was that was especially nice with kind of everything going on there with the way the yeah, print yeah. the print world is going. Exactly, you, you know, that's kind of a it's a good pickup for the Leader Post. It's a maybe a a, a, a tough, not a tough, but a, maybe a, an interesting move for him. Like because you you don't know what the leader post is going to be, what it what it's going to be in a year or six months even. Yeah. That's not a gamble, I want to say, but I mean. But at least he brings a name to it. Yes. A local guy yes. that's covered the local sports. Yes, it's a great yeah. hire for the leader post. Yeah. Definitely. So. I don't know what kind of writer he is. I know uh, his his broadcasts and stuff are really good, but I don't know what kind of writer he is. But anything is better than nothing. Yes. And that might bring a video element, you know, exactly. online. Well, yeah, because elements, right? obviously the leader post, they have to have an online presence as well. Yeah. So they can Especially bring when the deadlines at like two o'clock the day before for the yeah. newspaper. Yeah. yeah. Right. So <laughs> to get it printed in Estevan. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, it, it's, it's an interesting, uh, we'll see what happens. I mean, uh, I'm sure the coverage won't be super good next year either. Probably not. So. There'll be a drop off. I can almost guarantee it. It's yeah. unfortunate, but all of it's going to be drop off. There will be. Yeah, attendance. Yeah. Yeah. Everything's going to be drop off. off. Yeah. Yeah. You know, access is still doing twenty games though. Yeah, because I was asked to come back, and it was nice. it's Good. an absolute blast. And yeah, yeah. And Spencer's yeah. even talking about expanding the coverage, doing exactly. like a longer Pat's TV show and stuff like that. So that's and maybe doing some, away games. Yeah, maybe doing, doing some away games. The panels cool. again. Speed. Yeah. Well, because yeah. we did away games before the pandemic. Well, no, like oh. away games from the booth. Oh, okay. Like uh, from the broadcast, like uh, access is building. Like oh, kind of like I how see. we did the playoffs. Like yeah. he was talking about doing the BC road trip. So like yeah, some you're sitting there, you games. know, like 11 o'clock at night watching. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That'll be <laughs> sweet. It was, it, was, it was actually pretty awesome doing that for the, yeah. the four games that we had a chance to. Yeah, it was pretty fun. So yeah, it was a blast. And Something never done before, never done TV like that or anything like that. Didn't know anything about that stuff. And by all means, reviews are pretty high, right? Like everyone was pretty thankful that like we were there doing – yeah. That. yeah, That's I got good. a lot of feedback. Yeah. You know, some people knew that I was going to be on there. Some people didn't. And I see them. They're like, oh, hey, I seen you on TV. And, and <laughs> a lot so, of people so. didn't recognize me. I, I always wear a hat and I wasn't wearing a hat on TV. Yeah. And they're like, is that, is that Kevin? <laughs> yes, it's me. Yeah. <laughs> but I will but, say, though, like I'm as, like I'm going to echo Drew. Like it was an absolute pleasure to do games this year. And it'll be a pleasure to do games next year. Like this is a dream that I had when I was a kid. Right, like sitting up in the Safeway Fun Zone in the wooden bleachers, right, just wanting to you know watch the Pats every single day and you know call their games and you know to call Game Six like that's a highlight of my career right now. And uh, so yeah, I'm looking forward to next year, even if the team's not going to be as good or even if you know there's not going to be as much of a focus, I'll still be there and I'm going to be you know happier, uh, happy as can be to do it. So. Yeah. All right, yeah, I think uh, I echo those guys. It was, it was a fun season to watch. Obviously, with Bedard, it was it was something we'll never see again. And yeah, like like you said, Ryan, I I'll be back next year. I I enjoy watching the Pats, following them, stuff like that. I, obviously, Kevin does. He's been following them forever. So um, we'll be back with the show. I'm sure next year. I'm sure that's maybe the we'll, plan. Yeah, we'll have, maybe have you guys on maybe a little more often, kind yeah, of thing. Be fun, Pop on. Yeah. We'll have to have a little. I mean, it won't be as as intriguing talk, but uh, we'll have. You to. never know; they could surprise. Yeah, you never know. We don't know the the shape of a lot of the other teams yet. That's true. Yeah, It'd be nice for the past to surprise one year, right? They, yeah, they, they've they haven't done that yet in the past. Maybe I don't know how many ten years almost now. They haven't really surprised in a long time. Yeah. So I, I started becoming a real true Pats fan when the Pats weren't very good. So I was born when they were really good. I started becoming a real true Pats fan when they were not so good, and then they've kind of had their ups and downs and ups and downs. Like one round and out, one round and out, one round and out. Oh, second round, one round and out. No playoffs, no playoffs, no playoffs, no playoffs. <laughs> so, yeah, <hey. laughs> it'd be nice to see a little bit of surprise here, maybe in the next couple of years, to see what happens if they if they do sell off, they don't sell off, they try to build something. But we'll be here. So, and again, thanks for you guys coming on. Thanks uh, for having us. Yeah, this yeah. was fun. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, definitely was. So, all right. Well, if that's all we got, so have a good night, folks. Have a good one.